Well, Genesis 3, uh, 3 is where we're at. We'll pick up where we left off. I want to show you a little video clip first here of uh, Adam and Eve and their, their first argument. And uh, it'll, it's kind of funny. And uh, we'll play a role in what we're going to look at this morning because as God now comes back and begins to deal with Adam and Eve at the aftermath of, uh, uh, of the fall that we looked at last week. Adam, does this goat skin make me look big? Looks better on you than the previous owner. What? I'm having a hard time losing these last few pounds since bearing your children, and that's the best you can do? I look better than a goat? Thanks. Babe, you know you are the most beautiful woman on the planet. <laughs> what? I'm the only woman on the planet. Well, I can't help that. You know, and it's amazing that as the only woman on the planet, you still can't seem to remember my birthday or give me flowers once in a while. Well, I did give you a rib. Oh, right. I forgot about that since you haven't mentioned it for an hour. It's like your free pass to never lift a finger for me again. Never lift a finger? I am out there busting my rear all day. Food just doesn't pop up from the ground. I have to get it with the sweat of my brow. Since someone went and got the ground cursed. You think farming's hard? Try raising those kids. Try giving birth. Well, if someone wouldn't have taken advice from a talking reptile. Oh, here we go. Are you talking to me, you little snake? What? Oh, jump off a bridge? Oh, I would, but they haven't been invented yet. Oh, eat this fruit? Well, you look like a pretty trustworthy snake. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, well, we were until you went and pretty much ruined it for all of mankind, so good job with that. I seem to remember you taking a bite, too. Well, I thought I was eating from the tree of the knowledge of restfulness and serenity. Right. It's never your fault. Besides, what was I going to do with a fallen wife? That would just be weird. Oh, you fell for me? You're an idiot. Idiot? I named every single animal. Right. Great job with that. A, a prairie dog's not a dog. A seahorse isn't a horse. And a bald eagle isn't bald. Well, I was going pretty fast. Aardvark? Platypus? Okay, they were at the back of the line. Not everything can be cat or rat or bat. Hippopotamus? Yeah, well, woman was taken. <laughs> okay, how many gorge do you have back there? That was a joke. Not good for men to be alone. <sighs> no, it's great. Some things haven't changed, have they? <laughs> Somebody, you were laughing a little too loud there. Well, let's look at our uh, text again. And we're in verse 7, and we'll notice that the decision to sin brought dramatic change. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord uh, God among the trees of, uh, of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you, Lord? Then he, So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he uh, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not uh, eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So look, first we notice that the decision caused their eyes to be, uh, to be open. And of course, Adam and Eve did not have a sin nature uh, initially. We talked about their perfect communion with the Lord, their relationship with God. They didn't get up in the morning and have devotions. Their whole life was a, was a devotion. So things are radically changed once they decided to sin. And again, Eve is right in the fact that she was deceived. The Bible is very clear about that. It's also very clear that Adam is the one who, of his own volitional choice, he thought about it, he considered it, and then he sinned. He was not deceived. And therefore, Paul says of, of him, through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. In this way, death came to all men because all sinned or all mankind. So 
Um, she is right in a sense that it's, he's the one that uh, does it without de being deceived. Ken Hughes says about that moment, in an instant, the original couple passed from life to death, from sinlessness to sin, from harmony to alienation, from trust to distrust, from ease to disease. It did not take a day. It happened in a millisecond. And of course, with that came a loss of innocence, glory, shame, and a sense of guilt. Henry Blocker says that in the Bible, death is the reverse of life. It is not the reverse of existence. To die does not mean to cease to be. But in the biblical terms, it means cut off from the land of the living. Is that it is a diminished existence, but nevertheless an existence. So to fall into sin doesn't mean in dying. Remember, we said it's in dying, God said, you shall die. And a dying process began at that point, but Eve didn't eat and drop dead right then. She didn't cease to exist. Her life continued on, but certainly something did die. Uh, she died spiritually, and so did Adam in terms of their relationship with the Lord. That's why Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. And that's uh, true not only of them, but of every one of us. The assertion that uh, all sin describes the action of all in the past as well as all in the future because of what Adam and Eve did. Secondly, the decision caused them to notice to be afraid of God. They hear the sound of the Lord and they hide themselves. Why? Because of guilt, fear, shame, all that broke fellowship with God. Their relationship before was based on holiness. God is holy, and they, had a, they were holy themselves. They were without sin. They had a perfect relationship. Sin came in. That holiness was broken, and therefore fellowship was severed with God. Now, certainly it's the same with us. Even as believers, we come to faith in Christ. Our sins are forgiven. God then imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to us. He gives us a new nature. But if we continue in sin, then our relationship is, uh, is severed, or excuse me, our fellowship is severed with him, kind of illustrated in the prodigal son. You remember Jesus telling the story of the prodigal son who chooses, uh, like Adam, of a volitional choice to leave and, uh, and break fellowship with his father so that he could live a life of sin. Uh, and at some point in time, again, he remains the son. They still have that relationship, but fellowship is broken because he's no longer there with his father. And of course, if you follow the story, he begins to, in a sense, repent and begins to rehearse in his own mind what he's going to say to his father upon his return. And he's very much confessing his own sin. And uh, as he begins to approach, then Luke 15, 20 says that, that uh, he got up and went to his father when his father saw him a long ways off, his heart was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And that's a picture of God's love for us. Uh, and it, it's very interesting, that whole thing. The, even the repentance of the prodigal son wasn't the greatest. I don't know if you remember what he said. He goes, I'll just go back and be like one of the, uh, the workers there. I will go back and, and completely throw myself on the mercy of my father and, and come in and assume the duties and the responsibilities of a son once again. I'll just kind of still have a little bit of my own autonomy over here. It's kind of like a worker. See, even his repentance wasn't so great. But nonetheless, any kind of move back towards his father, his father's heart was filled with compassion and he ran to him to, uh, to meet him. And it's a picture of God's love for us as well. Yes, we can sin as Christians, but when we do, we're not breaking the relationship we have, but, but the fellowship is broken. But if we will confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, and so here we have, the, again, sin entering the world. Paul uh, asserts that all have sinned, all part of the fallout of the fall. Also with the decision causing them to, uh, to be afraid. Notice they hide themselves. But they now hear uh, the Lord coming. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's not like God wasn't there. God is everywhere at once. Uh, and in particular, 
his presence certainly in the Garden of Eden. We might compare it and understand it better to the tabernacle, remember later when the tabernacle is established under Moses, his Shekinah glory, his presence was very visi visible and very obvious. Uh, and, and everybody that walked up to that tabernacle could see and know that the presence of God was there. Was that the only place God existed? No, God is God, he exists uh, everywhere, all the time. Uh, all at once. But there was something unique and particular about his presence and his known presence there over the tabernacle. On the earth, in particular, to the Garden of Eden, here's a special place in the same way of God's presence. He was there all along, uh, yet uh, suddenly they become aware of his presence, and as they do, notice instead of running to the Lord to tell him what they've done and what happened, they actually run and, uh, and hide from the Lord. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 139, verse 7, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. It's not like they could run from the Lord. So as God approaches, notice there's really a picture of a, a loving father coming to the, the son or the child that has sinned like maybe... Uh, you have on occasion when you kind of catch your kids when they're young enough, red-handed doing something they're not supposed to be doing, but uh, uh, they haven't figured out really how to lie very well yet. And so when the chocolate chip cookies are cooling in the kitchen and the instructions are don't touch them because they're too hot and you come back five minutes later and, and, uh, and somebody's got chocolate all over their face and, uh, and the question uh, is from a loving father. I mean, you might come back and go, what are you doing? But I mean, from a loving father, it's like, oh, has anybody been trying the cookies here? I mean, you're, you're, you're stating a question. The, the obvious you already know, uh, that's what God is doing here. Hey, there's something wrong. You're kind of hiding here from me, aren't you? That, that's really the tone of what's taking place. And of course, Adam uh, then comes out of the trees and out of the bushes with his uh, beautiful designer fig wear on that uh, was not there before, his wife uh, following him, but no hint of accusation. And certainly this process is, uh, is graced uh, with God's mercy. The decision led also to a refusal to accept responsibility as we kind of saw in the video clip, at least it was alluded to. Uh, again, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, there's a real confession after sin. <laughs> What's he confessing to? I was like a little bit afraid and shameful, so I'm kind of hiding out over here. Yeah, but what did you do? Well, I'm just trying to share my feelings with you. I want you to know how I feel. That's the important thing. That's the uh, kind of the mantra of the day, isn't it? It's really not what happened. It's how I feel about it. And uh, that goes all the way back to, uh, to Adam here. Uh, the only thing he confesses to is his, his fear. But notice God's response. Who told you that you were naked? Serpent? The woman? Did you glance into a pool? How did you come upon, uh, upon this idea? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now notice Adam's excuse starts right here, guys. Classic. The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. The problem is here, Lord, it's not really me. It's the woman that you gave me. So it's really the problem is Eve. In fact, God, the problem is you because you're the one that put me in these circumstances. You're the one that gave. So whose fault is it that Adam sinned? It's God's fault. And uh, uh, this guy could get hired as a defense attorney today, you know, because it's, nobody's ever committed a crime they're actually guilty of. It's always the circumstances around it that caused it all to happen. Uh, Adam says, it's Eve's fault. Eve's excuse is a little better. She doesn't blame God, but she says it was the serpent who deceived me and I ate. So she still, still does not accept responsibility, uh, but, uh, but blames the, the serpent himself. Will Rogers once uh, remarked that there are two eras in American history, the passing of the buffalo and the passing of the buck. And uh, we're, we're living in the, uh, the latter stage of that, uh, that passing now. There was a, a couple of quotes I found from uh, an insurance company, the Metropolitan Insurance Company, from people after they were in car accidents and uh, fi filing reports with the insurance company. 
Uh, one guy made the, uh, the following statement about his accident. He said, uh, it was an invisible car that came out of nowhere. It struck my car and vanished. So it wasn't his fault, it was an invisible car. And then that car just vanished afterwards. There was another report that said, the guy said, the other car collided with mine without warning me of its intent. <laughs> so it's really not my fault. Maybe that's why we have no fault insurance because nobody wants to admit it anyway. You might as well, you pay for yours and I'll pay for mine because it's really nobody's fault. I, I can never figure that out when a drunk ran into me and I'm stopped at a stop sign, why I've got to pay for my insurance. I never, still don't really understand that concept, but it's certainly prevalent in our, uh, in our culture. We sometimes pass the buck based on circumstances. The student who cheats then rationalizes to God that he's the blame for giving him a difficult professor and a busy schedule. There's the thief who steals, blaming God because, after all, God, you knew my weaknesses and you allowed me into these circumstances. Uh, you really have as much to do with this as I do, and I've actually had guys tell me that. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's never, never my, my fault. The adulterous man who blames God for the ingredients that led to his sin, his depression, his poor self-image, that woman, the faraway place, his loneliness, it's, uh, it's all about the culture of, uh, of victimhood. Uh, the classic Calvin Hobbes, uh, of course, uh, comic strip of the 1990s, uh, basically uh, adults like because it was a constant commentary on our culture and what was going on in the world uh, at the time. Uh, in this one uh, in particular that uh, suits our case here, Calvin is kind of musing to himself and uh, begins the comic strip by saying, nothing I do is my fault. And then it goes on to the next caption, my family is dysfunctional and my parents won't empower me. Consequently, I'm not self-actualized. Uh, and then he continues with his arms closed. Looking up, he says, my behavior is addictive functioning in a disease process of toxic codependency. I need holistic healing and wellness before I can accept any responsibility for my actions. And then Hobbes, his friend, the little tiger, says, one of us needs to stick his head in a bucket of ice water. <laughs> and the comic strip ends with Calvin, Calvin saying, I love the culture of victimhood because it's always somebody else's, somebody else's fault. I was, uh, I've told this story before, but uh, <clears throat> taking, uh, when I coached uh, baseball in Pony League and I took the uh, kids to either the UH game or to see the, uh, the Sharks when they would play the Winter League uh, pro uh, guys that would play double A, triple A ball here. <clears throat> and these guys are, these kids are, they're probably, uh, probably nine and 10. And um, see if uh, Keone was here, I would say that it was his son that said this, which it might have been. But because uh, uh, Keone's son played for me. His kids are all 25 years old now. That was a few years ago. But uh, we're at the game, and of course, I don't know why, why 10-year-old kids have to buy the biggest soda in the whole place. It's, uh, it's more than they can drink. And, uh, and whoever it was, one of the kids sitting next to me, at some point in time, you know, he's only drank that much, kicks the whole, the whole thing over, you know, and then says to me, Coach, my soda fell over. Oh, wow, it just fell over. Uh, you didn't like kick it over or anything. No, it just fell over. Can I get another one? I go, oh, gee. No, I don't think that would be a good idea. No, in other words, if you had gotten excited at the game and you accidentally kicked it over, well, that'd be like an accident. You know, an accident's happened. You know, and then maybe we could get another one. But if you, we've got sodas that are just f falling over, <laughs> there's no point in getting another one because, you know, in fact, you might warn the other kids to grab their sodas because they're just falling over. So... <laughs> Uh, no point in getting another one. It could just happen again. Don't, don't you think it just happened again? Uh, uh, <laughs> the deer in the headlights. Yeah, I really did say stuff like that to kids. And, uh, <laughs> because it's, it's the, uh, and what are we trying to do? We're trying to get people to accept responsibility. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. You know, it's, it's pretty hard to be forgiven of a sin that you'll never confess, right? I mean, we've all got to be honest. And, and I'm, I'm the worst. I mean, they, they, we have to battle this, this whole thing that goes, 
We joke about it being in our culture, but it goes all the way back to, uh, to Adam, to the original sin. Something happens and something goes wrong, and the first reaction in your mind anyway is going to be, why it's not your fault? <laughs> why it's not your fault? Uh, it really takes some, some discipline to go, no, it is. I did this wrong. I blew this. And when it comes to it's not just a mistake you might make in your work or somewhere else, but especially when it's a moral issue, it's an issue of holiness and our relationship with the Lord, we need to make sure we're very careful to make sure we're, we're confessing and renouncing. Because if we do, we'll find mercy. And if we don't, that sin is still there. And I'm still the prodigal son who's off with the pigs because I've never repented and never come back to a loving Heavenly Father that's waiting to run and throw His arms around me. So again, there's the, uh, the passing the buck mentality. Paul says that the good news here in Romans 5, 17, because the buck stopped somewhere and it stopped with Jesus. doesn't matter what man does in his sin and who he blames, the blaming stops when Jesus comes. Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense, Adam's sin, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Sin comes into the world, Paul says, through the first Adam, but life comes to all of us through the second Adam, Jesus Christ. The buck stops with him. So there's a decision to sin and a broad dramatic change. And then verses 14 to 15, the Lord deals with the serpent and Satan. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the, the Lord deals with the serpent uh, first. And we've mentioned before that, that, uh, I, that we highly doubt this idea that, uh, that Satan appearing through this creature to Eve in the garden appeared as like a snake that we would know it today. Uh, everything in the garden was incredibly beautiful. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the, it's at least the connotation and even some, the idea of some commentaries on the word is that the serpent uh, and uh, the way it's described would have been quite beautiful and so forth. Uh, but whatever the creature was that Satan used, the creature itself uh, gets, gets cursed because of his cooperation in, uh, in what takes place. Now again, and we'll read a verse in a moment. We've done that before. We know that it was Satan called the devil that was working through this particular creature. But the creature itself gets cursed as, as well. Uh, because you've done this, you were cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. You shall eat dust all the days of, uh, of your life. So again, cursing the snake is consistent with the fate of other animals in Scripture as well when they cause injury to humans uh, and so forth. Exodus 21, 28 states that when an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be, be stoned. So even the animals under the Mosaic law face capital punishment if they, uh, they killed someone else. Uh, and, and again, in terms of the, the physical punishment, eating dust always signified abject humiliation. And we see that again in prophetic language as well. Micah the prophet is, is, uh, is talking about a fact that uh, at the end of the end, when Jesus Christ comes back to planet earth to rule and reign, he's going to be judging nations and so forth. And Jesus talked about that in Matthew 25. Uh, and Micah says this in Micah 7, 16, we get the same language here going back to Genesis 3 of these nations that will be judged. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. Again, abject humiliation. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God. So uh, again, even the judgment of those nations that have turned against Israel during the tribulation, again, Jesus judges nations when he comes back based on whether they are pro-Semitic or anti-Semitic, 
the ones that help Israel, the ones that are against Israel, and he judges them. And even when prophetic language, Micah takes us all the way back to Genesis 3, that's the idea of the serpent being cursed here as well. Now, in Revelation 12, 9, again, John tells us that the serpent really, for his actions, was Satan himself. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the Lord deals with, with Satan, not just with the, the animal itself. And we see that in verse 15. And I put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You shall bruise your, uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So there would be war, enmity between the woman and her seed. We could say all mankind. And Paul talks about how the whole world is under the power of the, the evil one. But in particular, it would be to the seed singular. And uh, I'll read you a little quote from uh, a couple of Jewish sources as well as what Paul says in Galatians uh, 3.16 in a moment. But it's going to be, and if you've got that word seed capitalized, it's for a reason that there's going to be enmity between the seed, who would be the Messiah, uh, and, uh, and the devil. Now, Again, as, as the story of redemption continues, we have Abraham singled out, and we know that the Messiah, the seed, will be one of his descendants. And of course, later he gets singled out to the tribe of Judah, later singled out to uh, of a descendant of David. Uh, and Satan knows the scriptures, and he's watching the fulfillment of God's plan of redemptive history. So his plan is all he's got to do is destroy the Jewish people. He can prevent the Messiah from coming. And so Satan has always been out there inspiring the attacks to try to destroy the Jewish people. Now, Satan also knows the end of the story. At the end of the story, at the end of the tribulation, what brings Jesus Christ back to planet Earth? Remember, there's a remnant of believers that, uh, are, that flee Jerusalem when the Antichrist sets up and calls himself to be worshipped as God in the newly rebuilt temple. And when he does, the Jewish people will flee out into the wilderness towards what we refer to as Petra, but in the Hebrew as Basra. And God supernaturally protects them. And at a point in time, then they cry out to Jesus that he is the Messiah. They will look on the one they have, they have pierced and they will mourn for one as one mourns for an only child, Zechariah says. And when they do that, then Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth. Now, Satan knows that so that if he can kill the Jewish people, he can prevent a remnant from being there. If they can't cry out, the Messiah can't come back and he won't have to suffer the fate that he would otherwise. So uh, the anti-Semitism in the world is satanically orchestrated and inspired, and it's growing, of course. Got to watch uh, Benjamin Netanyahu being interviewed uh, last night. Uh, on one of the news networks and was asked about the growing Semitism within Europe. I thought that was interesting. There's like an admission almost that it's taking place, given the fact that it was a CNN reporter. Uh, and so the, the, and there is, there's a tremendous growing Semitism, uh, anti-Semitism in Europe. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that what was interesting about it is that it's this strange coalition of, of people. Uh, you've got people, uh, you have the Islamics, that are in Europe who are very anti-Semitic and growing in numbers throughout, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, and then you've got them, and then you've got people way on the left, the big time liberals that are very anti-Semitic uh, uh, as well. And he says that it's a very strange uh, coalition of people. These guys are, are uh, stone gays, uh, uh, you know, oppress women, uh, will not allow them to have any education and so on and so forth under Sharia law. Uh, and then you've got the liberals that, that, you know, that hold a very different views and uh, about every other area. And but the one thing they agree on, they're, they're, they're against the Jewish people. Uh, and then you've got uh, what's called the new anti-Semitism, which is against the nation of Israel itself. And so therefore Israel uh, gets uh, six, seven thousand, eight thousand missiles shot at it. Uh, and if they retaliate, then they're the bad guys. Uh, they give up all the land in the Gaza Strip, and Hamas moves in and takes over. So now they're threatened by terrorists. They give up all the property in southern Lebanon, where they've taken and defended themselves. Hezbollah moves in, and, uh, and they're threatened by war up then. 
And the world says, and now we want you to give up East Jerusalem and uh, all of Samaria. And they're like, we don't think that's a real good idea. It hasn't really worked out well. Oh, you terrible people. You know, again, there's, this, there's no logic. It doesn't make sense. It's satanically inspired. It goes all the way back to Genesis uh, where there will be enmity between the woman, the descendants, mankind in general, against the seed, the Messiah. It was like that before he came. It's been like that since he came because he's coming again. Uh, the third thing here is the Lord delivers uh, uh, this wonderful promise uh, here in the last part of verse 15. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the Lord promises deliverance through the seed. The woman will produce the seed and will, uh, who will conquer Satan. Now it's very interesting as we get on into the story and we have the birth of Cain. And we'll point out in the language that as far as Eve knew, she thought he was the seed. I mean, God says, you know, there's going to be enmity, but I promise a deliverance through the seed, one of your children, uh, and he's going to be the deliverer, and uh, we'll look at that uh, here uh, next week or so, but she has a kid, she figures he's it, <laughs> she doesn't know that, no, this, this plan is going to take a while to be, to be formulated, but uh, the seed would be produced, who would conquer Satan, so the woman's offspring uh, we refer to as the Messiah, as the Christ, is the one who Satan will strike his heel, but he will crush his head. Uh, and again, it's uh, singular, not seats. And we know this from uh, certainly Galatians, but a couple other references. Uh, in 250 BC, when, uh, when Jewish scholars sat down to translate the uh, Hebrew into Greek so that more people could, uh, could read it, uh, referred to as the Septuagint, uh, and uh, when they do, uh, they are very clear. They interpret the word seed as a single individual, and their text would literally read, he will crush your head. Later, uh, more recently, a Hebrew scholar named Jack Collins talks about the fact that the word seed, uh, and every time that it's used as a singular with a pronoun that's masculine, it's always talking about uh, a person. He says it would be fair to read this as God's threat to the snake of an individual who engages the snake in combat and will win. And of course, that's what Paul tells us in Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say into seeds as of many, but as of one into your seed. So it's amazing right here in the very beginning. We have the creation we have the fall of mankind, sin entering the world. We've got, we've got Adam and Eve coming up with these totally lame excuses and, and really never confessing their sins at, at, at this point. Uh, God in his grace comes along and tries to, like a father, catching the kid with his hands in the cookie jar and, and uh, chocolate all over his face, re, re, despite his denials and what went wrong and whose fault it was, he comes along and says, that's all right. I promise you a way that this can all be redeemed and you can be saved from your sins and all could be made right. And the rest of the Bible is the fulfillment of that promise, uh, which makes it the story of, of redemption. Sometimes we say history is his story, his story of, uh, of how he's going to bring about the seed. Now, there's an interesting uh, incident that happens later with Moses that Jesus makes reference to that kind of ties right into this, uh, and it's recorded over in Numbers. I just want to read one verse from there, but you might remember the story of, of what we call the wilderness wandering. Moses is out there uh, with a million plus uh, Jewish people. Uh, they are not going into the land because of their own uh, uh, disbelief in, uh, in God's promises and so forth. And there's a point in time because of their sin and, and so forth, there's poisonous snakes that enter the camp. You remember they begin to bite people and people are dying. Moses cries out to the Lord, what should I do? And the Lord tells him to basically take, since that's the attack, take uh, one of those, make it out of bronze, put it on a pole, lift it up, and as the people will look to it in faith, then they will be saved. Numbers 21.8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, 
and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, Jesus says this about that particular incident, but you kind of get the picture. You've got serpents once again. Uh, you've got death ensuing as a result. But if you will look at something that represents that sin on a pole in faith, then you'll be saved. And Jesus comments about this when he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be, uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Paul fills in the commentary and says that of Jesus, he that had no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a picture of the serpent and how he brings sin into the world. There's a picture in the Old Testament under Moses of how the serpent comes in and infects uh, and, and is bringing death. But if there was something that could take away that sin and we could look to it in faith and be delivered, it's the promised seed. And Jesus says, it's me. I'll be lifted up, he on a cross, in the same way that that serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. And if you'll look to me in faith, whoever will will be saved and receive uh, eternal life. It's, uh, it's really an incredible picture that goes all the way back here to Genesis 3. And of course, this idea, not only a war against the woman and, uh, and Satan and her seed, but this idea of the, the connection between there would be an attempt in the future when the Messiah came, the seed, Satan would come in and try his best to attack. It will come across as a bruise on his heel or a striking on his heel in the process he would be crushed himself. And uh, the writers of the New Testament certainly point that out to us, that that is a picture of what happened with Jesus on the cross. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 2.14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, the Messiah, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. When Jesus Christ dies for our sins on the cross, Satan is defeated. Death is defeated. Death no longer has its hold. Death no longer has a victory over us. Death is quite a weapon that the enemy can use to hold before us and cause fear to come into our hearts. But there's a greater weapon, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, uh, if somebody pulls a knife on you, but you have a very large gun, you're okay. <laughs> and, and he has a weapon. Uh, but the weapon that we have is, is far greater in terms of the victory that Jesus Christ gives us on the cross. In fact, any weapons that are formed against us become useless in a sense because of the power of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. It's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, all the way back, uh, you know, the promise of the Messiah, in a sense, he's going to come, and then the connection, it's his death on the cross that is the ultimate victory. But um, uh, it just amazes me, the grace of God, that this, this promise is coming in the face of these, <laughs> these totally lame excuses. Where are you? Um, I'm just, uh, I'm just over here in the shade. <laughs> Why are you there? Well, I'm naked. How did you know that? Um, I don't, I just like fig leaves. <laughs> I'm not making a statement here. You know, and, and then it's, and then it's, well, I, I think really it's because you've probably eaten of that tree. Well, yeah, I might have done that, but you know, it's really your fault. And, uh, you know, and it's like, can you imagine you and your kids? I don't think right then you would jump in and go, let me tell you how much I love you. Let me, let me tell you that I don't even care what you're saying right now. This is what I'm going to do for you. You know, but, but God does. God, God does. He comes right in the middle of all of our lame excuses as to why we are the way we are. And, uh, and we can all go around and around and about the... Uh, our upbringing, what we didn't have, what went wrong, and, 
you know, it's really not me, it's that guy, he's such a jerk, and if you had to work for my boss, you know, you, you know, you'd curse once in a while too, Pastor. You don't know what it's like out there, you know. It's like we, we can all go around and around with all the stuff that we have to deal with, right? Uh, you know, and you know what? God looks at all and says, you know what? Died for you anyway. Died for you anyway. But he who conceals his sins won't prosper. But if you confess and renounce, then you'll find mercy. That's what we want to ever do because we are the uh, the excuse makers man we it's in our blood it comes it comes from adam and uh, we can be thankful that we've been born again <laughs> 